what if we took the two biggest sword related YouTubers, Shadowversity and Skologram, and had them fight each other in a sword fight, in a modern day Hemo style sword fight with blunted weapons, obviously. I've studied all their fights that they posted on YouTube, and I think I have the answer for you. So stick around and check it out. Oh, Jesus. All right, so let's take a look at our fighters in this hypothetical duel. Skaligrim, who's been making videos since 2009, and Shadowversity, who's been making videos since 2015. So if you're not totally aware of these guys, both of them cover subjects based around the wide spectrum of historical European martial arts, focusing on weapons, armor, techniques, and various tropes that show up in pop culture, such as fantasy, video games, board games, animes, cartoons, movies. You name it. So both of these guys have been in sword fights before. And we're going to base this hypothetical fight when they were both at their most active, around 2016 to 2018. Alright, so let's take a look at their experience. Around 2011, Skullgrim starts messing around with swords with his friends. Just experimenting, but he admits that he doesn't know what he's doing. Basically just trying to figure things out. A couple years later, around 2013, 2015, Skullgrim starts looking at manuals. He starts looking at the original sources. He starts fully gearing up with protective equipment and fighting with steel weapons, but still trying to figure things out on his own. By 2016, Skalagrim has joined Blood and Iron Martial Arts, or Blood and Iron Hema on YouTube. Here he receives training in German-style swordsmanship from experienced instructors, and he gets a lot of experience sparring with higher-level opponents. So Shadowversity is a bit more of a mystery. He doesn't go into his experience very much. According to him, he's been playing with swords his entire life. He mentions that he studied Kendo while in Japan, Though he doesn't give us any level of experience or achievement. And he also says that he has experience in Hema and sword play. Now as far as that goes, he has posted several videos of himself fencing primarily with foam swords. But he's only ever uploaded one video where he's fencing with steel swords. And in that video, he also says it's his first time wearing a fencing mask. So this is Shad's first and only time fighting with steel long swords in full kit. All right, so let's take a closer look at their actual fencing styles. All right, so here's the tale of the tape for this Clash of Titans. Skalagrim is three years the elder of Shadowversity. There's no reliable information out there on the height of these two guys, but um, they're both relatively the same size, under six feet tall, I believe. So I'm going to try to give you guys a good idea of how these two fight. This first category, which I could have named better, is basically their hit percentage. How often when they go for an attack do they land it? So as you can see, 79% of the time when Chad goes for an attack, he lands it. Now Skullgrim only lands about 33% of the time. To see my nervous There's a lot of factors that go into these here. stats and we'll I get into it as we go on. Now defense is their defense percentage. This is how often they intentionally avoid or stop an attack. Now Skullgrim has a 63% chance of defending move an incoming attack. Too soon. Goes to show how important it is to move to be extra safe. Alright, so Shads, um, what can I say? Shad does not really defend himself very often. In fact, he has almost zero defense with his actual sword, meaning he rarely uses his sword to defend against incoming attacks. The only real defensive move that Shad has is this little scoot back that he uses from his earliest videos even to his most recent ones, where he just kind of scoots himself backwards and does a little tippy tap at the top of his opponent's head. But other than that, really, Shad's defense is really, really bad. But that kind of plays into his score for initiative. This is how often the fencer will initiate an attack. And as you can tell, Shad is a very aggressive fighter. Shad tends to overwhelm his opponents with offense, which pretty much acts as his defense. And that is a very valid strategy. Now, Skullgrim is more of a cautious defensive fighter, and he only initiates attacks about 64% of the time under normal circumstances. Although, as we'll see later, there are some circumstances where he'll attack, attack more often. By... So now doubles. This is how often both fencers get hit while they're landing a hit. Now as it stands right now, the average HEMA double rate is about 10%. So Skullgrim's is pretty high at 23%. Now Shad's double rate is almost double that. His double rate is obscenely high. And that pretty much plays into the previous three stats. Shad aggressively attacks his opponents and doesn't defend himself very well. He looks for the first opening that he can find and he attacks without much regard. 
Next up, we have the Four Virtues of Fiore. So for those who don't know, Fiore de la Berry, he was a fencing master who published several fencing books in the early 1400s. He had four virtues that he believed that any good fencer should have. Here I've graded Shadowversity and Skullgram based on these four virtues and my own experience. These scores are not standardized, they're just my opinion. It's just to give you, the viewer, an idea of how these people fight. The first one up is Audacity, which is essentially boldness and courage in battle. It's represented by the lion with the heart under his paw. I believe that this is essentially the easiest quality to have in modern day HEMA because of all the protective equipment that we wear. I gave Skullgram a C here. I'm assuming that you find the, the commentary more useful than just putting music on That's causing to be a little bit timid. I gave Shadow B in this category because as you can see from the stats above, he's a very aggressive fencer. He faces his opponents head on and doesn't show many signs of fear. Next up is Fortitude. It's represented by the elephant with a castle on his back. Essentially this virtue is your ability to stand your ground. I gave Skullgram a D here. Skullgram has a respectable defense, but when his opponents get aggressive, his defense often breaks and he ends up retreating. Now I gave Shad a C here. Now Shad stands his ground, he almost never backs up. But the fact that his defense is almost non-existent prevents him from getting a much higher score here. Alright, next up is Celerity. It's represented by a... Um, well, it's supposed to be a tiger with an arrow. And it stands for speed, maneuverability, and grace. Things like that. Skullgram isn't super fast by any means, and I don't think he's slow in any way. His footwork isn't super fancy or anything, but his reflexes are really good and he can dash back very quickly. Shadowversity gets a pretty low score here. He does use very quick but weak attacks, and I do think he's got good reaction time and reflexes. But his footwork is, um, it's really weird. Like, it's weird. I can't say I've ever seen anybody move like he does. He leads on the same leg when he fences throughout the entire match. And he does this weird thing where he kicks his forward foot out. He kind of rocks back and forth in a strange way. So he plods a bit. Next up is Prudence, represented by the Lynx, who the people in the Renaissance thought could see into the future. It's also about knowing your distance, and making intelligent decisions while fencing. I think Skullgram's a fairly smart fencer. His distance management is pretty good. He makes a good effort to stay off the center line when attacking. But he does have some spatial awareness issues, and he is prone to making some silly decisions sometimes. I gave Shad a low score here as well, because I don't think he makes intelligent decisions to protect himself while he's fencing. When purely on the offense, Shad does a pretty good job of knowing when he's in range to attack, Defensively though, he's pretty bad at it. He absolutely never moves or positions himself laterally. He always heads straight down the center line and generally right into an opponent's attack. Alright, so we're going to use a similar score system to the Victoria Highland games that Skullgram participated in back in 2018. Not going to worry about edge alignment because it was too hard to track. Both fencers lose if there's three doubles, and there will be a maximum of 12 exchanges. To come up with the results, I used several methods. I wrote a lot of information down, uh, created kind of a um, really messy algorithm, and converted it into basically dice rolls. I also worked through a lot of these exchanges, um, just messing around with them with a partner. And I also had two fencers study both of these guys, and then try to imitate them, and try to recreate the fight without each other knowing what was going to happen. And then after that, it was my own experience. So I took all that, <laughs> combined it all together, and I think I have the absolute best idea of how this fight would go. So the first part we're going to look at is the pre-fencing. This is the positions or stances or guards that the fencers will choose when they're approaching each other. Whether it's for a biomechanical advantage or a psychological advantage, you want to oppose the other person in a way where you can strike or defend yourself with an advantage. Um, some guards match each other very well, some do not. Skullgrim switches his guards frequently, depending on what his opponents are doing. He has a very specific plan that he likes to use, depending on what his opponents are doing. His most favorite guards are what his school calls the Wrath Guards. One on the right, one on the left. The one on the left, he prefers to use a little more often, I think. Chad, on the other hand, only uses one guard, or a variation of that same guard. And that is Long Point, or Longa, or Langort, or whatever you want to call it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Long Guard is a very true neutral guard. Um, it can pretty much handle anything. It's a very balanced and natural and easy to use guard that most people stick to. But there's an interesting factor in this. See, Shadowversity is more aggressive overall, but when Skullgrim sees an opponent in long guard, he actually becomes more aggressive because he has a game plan when dealing with it. Now, Skullgrim does 
circle his opponents. He does move quite a bit, but when his opponents are standing still, he also just kind of goes straight down the center. So the way I envision it is that Shad goes straight down the middle, and Skalagrim meets him. Shad begins in his long guard, and Skalagrim starts off in either his right wrath guard or his left wrath guard. It doesn't really matter which one he uses because he goes for the same plan regardless. Skalagrim's main method of attack, the game plan that his bread and butter that he uses the most through all of his fencing matches, whether he uses the right wrath guard or the left one. Faint with a thrust or a false edge cut, and then he'll attack on the other side. That is pretty much what he looks for anytime he goes for an attack. Now if his opponent attacks while he's going for this, often what he'll do is he'll attack the sword with the false edge, essentially performing a crump howl, which is going on top of his opponent's weapon to displace it, and then he wheels around. Skullgrim will attempt this move several times in any given match. And the more successful he is at it, the more he seems to be encouraged to keep on trying it. Shad's first method of attack is to jab or thrust at his opponent with a very quick, weak, light attack that I don't think he intends to actually hit. I think he's trying to provoke a reaction out of his opponents. Skalagrim, seeing his opponent in long guard, is immediately going to attack. And Shad's going to play into that pretty immediately. Skalagrim's going to attack by feinting to his right side. He's going to collect Shad's jab, and he's going to wheel around and hit. Now when Skalagrim goes for this attack, he actually leans his whole body this way. And that's kind of an important factor for this exchange. So Shad actually encounters this move during his first exchange in his first match with the Hema Practitioner. And he doesn't take it very well. Now, one thing to note is that Shad doesn't have very many defenses or counters. Um, he essentially says in that same video that uh, if he can't figure out a way to defend himself, he'll just try to hit his opponent back. And that's what he does when he comes up against this move. As his opponent hits him, Shad comes up to the side and tries to hit his opponent with the false edge. But with Skalagrim leaning to the side as he goes for this attack, I don't think he gets anything. So the way I imagine this is that Skalagrim lands a clean, and I don't think that Shad comes up with a quality return. So the first exchange, I'm giving the Skalagrim. Lost some of that footage there, but essentially Skalagrim hits him in the head, which is where he mostly lands that blow. For the second exchange, same strategy. Shad is going to attack from his long guard, and Skalagrim is going to attempt the same move again. But Shad's not about to let him get away with it this time. This time, Skalagrim doesn't quite move as intelligently as last time. He goes for the feint, doesn't quite sell it, and he goes for the wheel around. Now the difference here is that Shad has very good reaction time. The problem is he doesn't really have good reactions. And his first MO, when he sees an opponent attacking sometimes, is to launch straight towards them to hit them. So Shad does one of his large steps. Shad has a very large stride when he goes for his attacks. Uh, and this time he'll use one of his other attacks. This is essentially a horizontal shot to the body. This is Shad's main attack that he will consistently land. He likes going for the body right under the armpit no matter how he gets it. So Skalagrim, committed to his attack, attacks straight down on the angle, while Shadiversity plows into him with that middle blow. This shot here that Shadiversity lands is Shad's main target in pretty much all of his fencing matches. He will try to hit right here as often as he can. Interesting thing is, this is Skalagrim's main weak point. He's very bad at defending right here. If you attack him on this side, Skalagrim will usually use a hanging parry and catch it pretty quickly. But on this side, he gets hit quite a bit. So for that exchange, I'm going to give that a double. Um, Shad lands one to the body. Skalagrim lands one again to the head. And with that, we already have our first double. All right, for the next exchange, uh, this is an interesting one. I would say by this point, Skalagrim's still feeling pretty good. Usually his first couple of rounds are his most aggressive. Shadiversity, once again, in his long guard as usual. And Skalagrim goes and rushes in for an attack. This time, perhaps he's looking to mix it up, but he doesn't quite calculate. Skalagrim does have a bad habit of sometimes walking straight into an opponent. There's not a huge sample size of Shadiversity going up against traditional European guards. Um, but in the very few instances where he faces off against a Wrath Guard or a Posted Adana or whatever you want to call it, um, he aims for the exposed shoulder. So if I was in this Wrath Guard, Shadiversity would probably try to stab me here. Shad does a very quick 
cut and thrust. If he can land a quick cut, he'll tap it and withdraw. But if his opponent commits, he will land the thrust. That's the way I see at least one of these exchanges in this match playing out. Skalagrim walks straight into his opponent, doesn't quite measure himself right. So Shad places one right in Skalagrim's midsection, essentially giving Shadiversity a, a clean hit because Skalagrim walks straight onto it. Shad also does a very good job when he does this move and puts his hand straight up high, protecting himself from any kind of downward blow that Skalagrim would have been going for. So I counted this as a covered thrust because of the way Shad puts his arms up very intelligently and because Skalagrim likely would have had his hands up high. So this is where Skalagrim changes things up a bit. Usually after he learns a little bit of a lesson from his mistakes, he starts his counter-fencing and becoming a little bit more defensive. So as Shadiversity aggresses, Skalagrim is going to start backing up. And what he's looking for is for Shad to commit to something. Now as Shad loses distance, he makes up that ground with this lunging attack that he likes to use, where he essentially kicks one of his feet back and lunges very far in order to make up the distance and attack his opponent. Now his main attack here is either going to be a long thrust, or he's going to go for a middle attack. Now when Shad goes for this move, he says in one of his videos that the telegraphing of his feet are there to distract his opponents or something like that. Um, and that could potentially work, but Skullagrim has actually faced a defender who has used almost an identical technique to this, although not exactly the same. And what Skullagrim did in that situation was something he's very good at. He shoots backwards, and he attacks the arms. Now Shad kind of sets himself up to be hit by this, because when he does, when he goes for his big lunging attack, is that he puts his arms out far, and then turns as he goes for the attack essentially putting him in the perfect position to hit Shadiversity in the arms, which he has presented to Skullgrim very nicely. So, not a big scoring hit, but I think Skullgrim gets at least one of those. Sometimes Skullgrim does kind of freeze and attack down mostly the middle. He doesn't attack diagonally or laterally enough. So, he is sometimes inclined to simply shoot one from the shoulder, Kind of like a fulcrum, straight down. A little bit of a diagonal, but not enough. So when you attack for the arms like this without positioning your body correctly, it actually leaves you vulnerable to an attack as you're going for the arm hit. It's a mistake that Skalagrim makes quite a bit. It's a mistake that I've made quite a bit in my career. And it's a mistake that all HEMA practitioners make. It's also a mistake that Shadiversity makes. Because the way Shad holds his sword is like this. Whatever my sword is, my sword is blocking my front. But then, if you are able to move to an angle, well now, you'd have got a direct line. Now, this is good for Kendo, but for the European Crucifix Form Sword, this is actually very bad. If you hold the sword like this, as you can see, you're not really protecting anything. You're not engaging the cross guard at all. It's not protecting anything. If you want to hold your sword forward like this, you should angle it, or as my teacher calls it, putting the pommel in your pocket. This protects more of your body, and you're engaging the cross guard more. You're letting it peek out to protect you. Now it can actually catch something. Another sword comes down, it can catch something. Like this, no sword is going to go over top of the sword like this. They're all going to come from these angles. So you want to keep it on a diagonal. Or alternatively, you can just hold it like this. There's several positions that hold it with the horns of the cross guard facing outwards. So I think this double to the arms would happen at least once during this match. So five exchanges in and we already have our second double. So another technique that Skullgrim likes to use sometimes is a low guard. In Italian fencing we typically call it the boar's tooth. I don't know what it's supposed to be in German fencing other than possibly the changer. Um, but they use one that looks exactly like the Boris Tooth. Shad has actually encountered this guard. Now, Shad doesn't encounter low guards very often. And when he does, he's very aggressive towards them. And every single time he goes for his attack, he always fails because low guards are there as a trap. They're essentially an invitation for you to attack. Shad doesn't quite seem to understand during this time period what a low guard is used for. Uh, in one of his videos, he mentions that low guards are used for protecting your legs. For instance, 
uh, low stances, stances where you hold the sword low, all right? I found I have a very natural instinct to protect my legs whenever I see a move, an attack or anything that's even coming close towards it, and I naturally am able to move my legs and dodge the attack than needing to block it with my sword. I don't think any source that is used in HEMA mentions using a low guard to protect your legs for any reason. Low guards are there as an invitation. That is what the fool guard is for. You essentially put your sword out, uh, you expect your opponent to attack, and then you counter. Low guards are also positions to rest and after you throw an attack. When you perform a strong attack, you settle down low. You might not want to stay there long, but it's always good to know how to fight in a low guard just in case you find yourself ending up there. Sometimes you don't always have time to reset into another guard or a position that you find more favorable. Sometimes you have to learn how to fight from low. And sometimes you do need to use an attack that is strong enough to clear that space to get down low. So even if you don't like low guards, it's definitely important for you to learn them because you never know when you might find yourself in one. In Shad's second exchange in his first ever bout with a HEMA practitioner, um, that fencer actually does use Italian fencing and sets up a very basic counter with the Boar's Tooth Guard, which is to parry the attack incoming straight up with the false edge, which is the edge of the blade that is not in line with the knuckles. So you, you attack, displays, and then you just come crashing down without stepping. That's Fiora's advice. Shad had absolutely no answer for that move when he encountered it. Scholagrim's choice of attack here is not one that I would use, and it's a little bit slower. Uh, essentially, instead of attacking with the false edge, turns it and attacks with the true edge. Then, after displacing his opponent's attack, he turns the blade and comes straight down. Now, even though I believe this attack is a bit slower than the Boar's Tooth counter that Shadowversity fell for in his second exchange, um, I still do think that this move would land, and it would land high, because Shad doesn't know anything about low guards or some of these HEMA techniques that he ran into. I think that Skologram would land somewhere on the shoulders, clavicle, or head with this attack. Because I don't believe that Shad would try to raise his arms to defend himself. So I count this as a headshot. It could have landed anywhere, but because of the way Shad fences, Skologram was able to pick his target, basically. Now, like I said, Wrathguard is pretty much Skologram's favorite guard. And there's one problem I have with it, which shows up in some of his videos, is that he kind of squares his shoulders like this a little bit. And he puts his elbow out. So typically, the advice for this move in the Italian version, which is called the Posa di Donna, or the Guardia di Spalla, is you want to keep your arms back a little bit. You don't want to square your shoulders. I'm a big guy. Uh, I want to give people less of a target to hit. Now, even though my target doesn't diminish that much when I turn, it's still better than squaring my shoulders like this. I want to turn my arm and my body away when I go for the attack. So when Skullgrim leaves himself out here like this, and Shad is going for his jabs, there's a very good chance that he's going to hit Skullgrim in the arm, at least in one of these exchanges. One of Skullgrim's other big guards is this high guard. Um, it's called Vom Tag. Some people call it High Vom Tag. Essentially, he waits to crash down and attack on his opponents. Now, when Chad sees somebody attack from up high like that, sometimes he attacks low, sometimes he attacks high against his opponent's weapon. So, I could imagine they both meet in the middle. When he's up in a high bind, uh, essentially what Chad does is he will leave the bind with his opponent's sword still up in the air. He will leave the bind and attack the middle. Now, this kind of thing has happened to Skologram, and essentially what he does is that most likely, he will just bring it right down because he won't have a defense for the move. Um, so I do see that one as being a double. Um, uh, Skullgrim taking a shot to the side again, and Shad taking a shot to the hit. So that doesn't count as a double because Skullgrim's hit lands slightly after and not at the same time. Okay, at a certain point in the match, Skullgrim's going to notice that Shad always leads with the same foot forward. Shad always keeps his right foot forward. Um, he only switches occasionally when he wants to step forward for an attack. And Skullgrim will go for one of his leg attacks. Uh, he usually goes for at least one of these per match. Shad's answer to the leg attack is very similar to what's suggested in Fiore 
and other fencing manuals. That is basically to get your legs out of the way and counter a pie. In Shad's Steel Longsword match, um, his opponent never throws an attack at his legs. In his phone matches, Shad comes up against leg attacks quite often. I um, mean, he's actually very good at dodging them. I probably didn't give enough credit for his speed when I assessed him earlier. And they're much faster than Steel Longsword, then he has to do it at a closer range because foam swords are generally shorter than the steel fetter that Skologram is. And that's where I'm coming up with a problem here. Shad is very good at dodging these very fast foam simulators, but they are generally about six to ten inches shorter than the steel fetter that Skologram is using. So the question is, would Shad be able to hit Skologram and evade this much longer weapon, which does travel slower than the foam simulators? But the thing is, Shad's ability to dodge these foam swords might be due to the fact that he's so used to facing them. During his video titled uh, Let the Sword Fighting Begin, he ends up facing one of the more experienced LARPers uh, in the video, and they use some kind of polearm simulator made of foam. Uh, during that match, uh, Shad's opponent uses a leg attack, and it appears that Shad gets hit in the leg as he's performing the counter. So that leads me to believe that maybe Shad couldn't dodge the steel longsword because he's not quite used to that length. So basically you have three scenarios here based on where we're at. If Shad is able to score this hit without getting hit in the legs, uh, he would take the lead. If Skologram would end up getting the hit, he would take the lead. But if they get a double like what happens in this video, uh, this match is over with. And that's kind of what I believe would happen. Um, the match will be over with because after three doubles, the match gets thrown out. Now that seems like kind of a cop-out, like kind of a crap ending. Um, but fact of the matter is, uh, I planned on going 12 rounds with this, but every single time I've run through the scenarios of this, um, it never gets there because Shad's double rate, uh, accompanied with Skologram's double rate, is just too high. It will end up getting three doubles before you get to 12 exchanges. In all the ways that this fight played out, um, I think this ended up being the best version or my favorite version. So who do I think would win? The fact of the matter is, is that this is kind of a messy match. They do provide an interesting counter to each other. See, Skologram easily has the experience edge here. Joining a fencing school gives you the benefit of fencing higher level opponents. And what that does is it forces you to up your game. It pushes you to a higher level. Um, Shad only ever fenced in any of his videos pretty low level opponents. Even the Hema practitioner that he faced was within his first year. I think he said eight months of experience, which is not enough time to get very good. That doesn't necessarily mean that Skologram has a huge advantage. Sometimes the problem with facing new people when you're at a certain level, you start to expect intelligent behavior. So you don't expect someone to hit you in the ribs while you're about to hit them in the head. You find yourself doubling and have a very sloppy match against somebody who doesn't quite know what they're doing because usually new people are just eager to get that first hit. And that's kind of where Shad is at in terms of experience. He's, he fences like a new person. I think he fences like a very good new person. Um, and I'm not saying that necessarily as an insult. Shad says in several of his videos that he doesn't think he's the greatest fencer in the world. Um, nor does he think that he's very good at it. And yeah, I can confirm, uh, Shad's not a great fencer. He's very good for the tool set that he has, which is very limited. Um, if he took some time to train and, and fight against more skilled opponents, I think that he has potential to go much further than he is. Easily. Skologram is a very good student of his school. If you watch Blood and Iron Hema's a YouTube channel, you'll see that Skologram follows their teachings to a T. And it's usually those good students who have the most potential to grow. Uh, the ones who just kind of are humble, uh, they remove themselves, they remove their ego, and they just absorb, and they just learn. So basically, uh, long story short, I think that Skologram would win. Um, I think that it'd be messy. I think that Shad would be trouble. In most of the scenarios that I played through, um, it really just became Skologram picking Shad's arms apart, which I think he'd have a very high success rate at because of the way Shad holds his sword. Another point I wanted to make is that uh, a keen eyed observer might have noticed that um, I've refilmed a lot of this. I've actually been sitting on it for quite a few months. Um, that is because Shad got himself in some controversy with Matt Easton, and I didn't want to release the video where it would seem like I was trying to pick on somebody or take sides because I was being more harsh towards one person than another. Uh, and then recently, I was about to upload it, and then 
this whole thing with self sword arts happened. I'm not trying to uh, take sides or get involved in any stupid crap. I didn't make this video to pick on anybody. The whole purpose of this video is actually to take two famous YouTubers that would draw people's interest in watching a fight breakdown where people could potentially learn something about what we do. If you go back and look at some of my videos, you can probably catch me making some of the very same mistakes that I pointed out that they've made in this video. I'm not trying to say I'm the best fencer in the world or that they're the worst. I'm not trying to say that I would beat both of them in a fencing match. I mean, I probably would. It was literally just for a learning experience. Being a good fencer takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of dedication. I couldn't imagine being a full-time YouTuber and doing fencing all the time. It takes a lot of work to do YouTube. It takes a lot of... I mean, editing takes a long time. It takes me a long time to make videos. I don't have all day to work on them. And that's all the more reason why your support matters. So please make sure to like and subscribe. Um, literally, I'm not even monetized as of the making of this video. So your support really matters. Hitting that like button and hitting that, sh hitting that subscribe button is very important. Uh, the algorithm completely gives up on you if you don't get those views and those likes and those comments. So I'm trying to make it in the YouTube world. Um, if you like my content, please like and subscribe. If you want to support me, I have a merchandise shop. Um, I also sell a HEMA-related book. And I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it uh, didn't ruffle too many feathers, and I hope you learned something. Um, i got other videos in the works, so hopefully I'll see more of you soon. There's another exchange that could potentially happen, but I don't think it would. And that is a grapple situation. Now, between the two of them, I think there's only three grapple situations that are even recorded uh, between them. Scalagrim gets pushed out of the ring by one of his opponents in, in a match and gets thrown down pretty easily. And in another match, he tries to take down somebody bigger than him and he essentially gets kind of squashed. <laughs> um, Shad has only one grapple on record that we know of, and he pretty much floors his opponent pretty quickly. It's actually kind of impressive. Um, so if a grapple situation ever happens, you'd have to give that one to Shad, although I don't think either of them would ever initiate that attack. But if it happened, uh, statistically, you have to give it to Shad. So I think Shad would win this grappling exchange. Huh? You trying to grapple me? Uh, uh, ah!